No one, least of all the Rolling Stones themselves, could have imagined that they'd still be together 50 years after first starting out. You might have put some money on the energetic Mick Jagger making it, but who would have guessed the volatile Keith Richards would even be alive today? But half a century on, they are the greatest rock and roll band of all time and they can't stop touring the world. They'll be in Australia next year, continuing their golden anniversary celebration, an event so big it's taking them two years to market. <laughs> Just the oldest, but the greatest rock and roll band in the world today. Despite their signature lyric, they do get a lot of satisfaction out of being the Rolling Stones. The air you breathe, the water you drink, the food you eat, and then there's rolling stones. And I guess we're just part of the furniture, you know? I think the Rolling Stones were really lucky. They were also quite hardworking, and, uh, you know, we've had our, you know, really had some great moments and everything. It's nice to meet them. But rock and roll's eldest statesmen really don't need any introduction. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. 70-year-old Mick Jagger. Hey. Keith Charlie. Richards, 70 next week. Yeah, have you done the guitar? Charlie Watts, 72. Scenery. Yeah, could you keep your eyes down, please? Bloody hell. And the 66-year-old youngster, Ronnie Wood. Hey, you You can't always get what you want. Men who really do seem to always get what they want. The world's largest concert crowds, made up of not just people who remember them from 1962, but their children and their grandchildren. When you're in Australia, yeah. and you look into that sea of faces, you will see people of our generation, you will see people of our children's generation and, our cho and their children. Might <laughs> depends. <laughs> that's the that's the norm you in a always, big outdoor yes, show, and you always sell out. How does it strike? How does the music strike across the generations in that way? Well, the older ones that have got all the money bring the younger ones and pay for them, and the younger ones say, "All right, if you force me, but will you buy me a beer when you get there?" No, but that's a little too self-deprecating <laughs> because my eleven, twelve-year-olds are very excited about the fact that I'm talking to you. That, I mean, it's very gratifying. I mean, I think that they, a lot of times, you know, they've heard about you through their parents or their older brothers or sisters or something like that. But there are a lot of great and talented people in the music world. Sure. What is it about the Stones that created this extraordinary head, heads up singularity? I often ask myself that. It's a weird, I think, just a strange piece of chemistry. So uh, it's just why it should work. I don't know. I couldn't, you know, put it in a laboratory and uh, try and figure out Charlie Watts, <laughs> Mick Jagger, and Keith Richards, and, and sort of shake them all about and put them in. I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> I got my first drum kit when I was 12. Please allow me to introduce myself. The steady beat behind the band, the drummer has the best seat in the house. Mr. Charlie Watts, my home. But for all that he's seen and done, Charlie Watts is the most reluctant of superstars. Go on, speak. Hello. Because you are such a, can I say, reticent man or a private man, you wouldn't have known what you were getting into when you joined the Stones, and had you known, would you have joined? I, uh, yeah, you know, I, when I was asked to turn up, up, up the road to rehearse, the, the Rolling Stones was another band to me, and it was going to last like the others, three months or a year. 
When you got the gig with the Rolling Stones, uh, did you have to think twice? No. On the other hand, Ronnie Wood loves the lifestyle and can't get enough of it. Critics say the band is playing better than ever. Now, how do you account for that? I don't know, it's just a good feel, a uh, great feel musically, and the interaction with the audience is even better. We get four generations of people watching us. It's fabulous. It's a marvellous thing to see the little nips getting turned on to the same music as the great grandparents. Yeah, and we're the common bond. This was Hyde Park in London, midsummer this year. A Rolling Stones extravaganza watched by hundreds of thousands. And similar to the show they're bringing to Australia to mark their half century. Whose idea was it? I hear it was yours. To celebrate it, uh, any excuse to get the boys together. How do you get it going? What is it, a phone call? Uh, no, a fax uh, or a text? Uh, threats. <laughs> <laughs> threats and disappointment, uh, you know. Uh, but actually, to tell the truth, it's a matter that you feel it. I mean, you start to feel an itch going, I say, OK, let's scratch it. On the road is a wonderful culture. I mean, I'm a product of the road myself, right. hence the wreck you see before you. Uh, but it's, it's great, isn't it? especially as young people, to go out on the road. Yeah, I mean, it's fun and it absolves all your responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make love to you, baby. It was an entirely different world when the Stones started out. Post-war Britain, a drab landscape of rationing and austerity. My Australian relatives used to send us some, um, you know, tins of fruit and and uh, tins of peaches. peaches yeah. Yes, tins of peaches. Well, peaches are one ten... of those things that are better tinned than... Exactly. <laughs> so it's uh, tins of peaches and tins of all things and used to get this regular kind of care parcel from Australia because they knew that we were being rationed so much. If we gave them tinned fruit, the Americans gave the Brits rock and roll. To which they added their own twist. I mean, to my generation, basically, rock and roll suddenly turned the world uh, from black and white into Technicolor. First, it was the Beatles. The Rolling Stones aren't everyone's cup of tea. Then came their much darker counterpoint. There are whole armies of parents who become almost homicidal at the sight of them. My memory is parents loved the Beatles, but they didn't like the Stone so much. Yeah, well, that was the sort of... That was our kind of, you know... Differentiation. Our, yeah, that was a kind of pub PR kind of dream. It was true up to a certain point. It was always best to have your PR believable. Centre stage has always been the Richards-Jagger relationship. They were mates in primary school. Years later, when they caught up again as teenagers, they realised, to their surprise, they'd developed the same interest in music. We bumped into each other on the train, and the man had the records, you see. Uh, Mick, yeah, he always... <laughs> He had these records under his arm, and I'm looking, and I'm wondering whether to mug him or not. <laughs> you know. These were blues records, I yeah, take it, from the Murray. Muddy Waters record, a Muddy, Best of Muddies, and the Chuck Berry record. Uh, I mean, this was enough to mug somebody for, you know. But he decided, yeah. I said, no, we'll make friends. <laughs> <laughs> the most wonderful repertoire. And is it true there's something like 500 songs? I don't, there I don't know written, how many songs you've lost count. is there. I don't think we could actually play the 500. You know, if you put us no. in a room and say, play, <laughs> play, play number, number three. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't think we could, I don't think we could do that. 
But we got a good, you know, we have a big amount of songs that are on our list. The Stones' success happened overnight. Almost as soon as they started playing in small clubs, the kids were queuing around the block. In no time, they had to move to bigger venues, and that's when things got really rough. You could say it was a bit of a nightmare at times as well, but it was funny. But it's also quite scary as well at moments. You can see at moments in there. That's what it could have been. It could have gone either way, you know. Well, you didn't finish many gigs, did you? Yeah, many we didn't. Concerts. We didn't finish a lot of concerts. Yeah. It made it very easy on me to do like three or four numbers, because <laughs> <laughs> you knew you weren't going to finish longer. them. For the Stones, teenagers had a voice, and the establishment found that voice both raucous and threatening. Their music, their anarchism, and their controversial use of drugs were all seen to be sapping the moral fibre of the nation. But the biggest threat to the band came from hysterical girls, and maybe from the social commentators. When these girls pounce upon Mick and seem to want to tear him to pieces, it's not essentially an act of aggression, but rather an act of devouring him. They want to incorporate his essence. It's a sort of fetish, fetishism which has more... I mean, I've been scared a few times. I've been shot at a few times. And it, but nothing scared me as much as being caught in a crowd of 13-year-old girls that have just lost it. Tamed pieces. And I mean, they're tearing you to bits. You know, and, uh, you know, if there's one way to die, you know, <laughs> it might as well be it, pal. Sadly, I've never experienced that, but no, I can imagine. you should that. try it. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot in life Keith Richards hasn't tried. This one, this is my main man. As you'll notice, he's only got five strings because mm. uh, I'm too tight to spring for this thing. Can I look at the hands that use the tools? Now, that's what a lifetime of these kind of Mike tools... Mike Tyson's got better hands yeah, than this. These <laughs> are incredible. <laughs> While maturity may have subdued his excesses, the music's as loud as ever. And when you're part of a group with as many hits as the Stones, who can begrudge you moments of? Remember, you know, we had just had Satisfaction out, and uh, I mean, that was the, boom, the biggest hit so far, boom, worldwide. And Mick and I are sort of sitting back in a motel room somewhere, well, oh, thank God for that. And there's a knock at the door saying, uh, where's the follow-up? <laughs> Oh, and then you realise you're really into a grind. It's, uh, you know, in those days especially, you needed a single every what, 12 weeks. Yeah. But it certainly taught you a lot about uh, writing well, again, songs. Again, it's a way to learn it, isn't it? Not at the academy, but on the job. Yeah, on the job, right. A lifetime apprenticeship which arrives <laughs> at perfection <laughs> that we see before us here. I'm still the apprentice, <laughs> I think. Um, There's still stuff to learn. Yeah, always. If there wasn't, there wouldn't be any point. Can you tell me, uh, the moment you step onto the stage, and yeah. how do you handle that mentally? I mean, what are you thinking? What are, how, are you, how do you prepare? How do you energise? Well, there's a lot of questions in one. But uh, you... you um, I don't know, I've been doing it for so long that I don't really, I don't sort of analyse it really anymore. But I mean, you have to get, obviously you have to be prepared, you have to know what you're going to do. It's entirely professional. You, you've got to be professional yeah. then, once you're very professional then you can do what you like. And when you play the first note? Bang, with well, a minute it's in then. That's it. There's an exchange of energy between the audience and the band, and, and it usually clicks right there. No one understands the chemistry of a band better than a drummer 
who's been there since the beginning. He spent a lifetime watching them play. Mick Jagger, uh, apart from being a really good lyricist, he's the best front man in the world. And Keith? He's the best rhythm guitar player. He's a one-off. <laughs> one one-off, Keith. And Ronnie? He can do and play anything. There's one other bloke, Charlie Wiltz. What's he like? I've got no idea what he's like. Miserable most of the time. Sitting at the back moaning about things. He's a great talent, though. Not really. But was he just lucky, was he? Very lucky. <laughs> but nobody is luckier than Ronnie Wood, who joined the band in 1975 when they were already well established. This is great. Tell me about this. Oh, it's a part of a series that I did of all, all of the boys. Before he was a Rolling Stone, he was an artist. And these days, he continues to paint. His work's fetching five figures in galleries. Can we look at the other one? In the dunny? Oh, yeah. Though one I noticed at the Stone's London headquarters... Now, that's a rhinoceros. Yeah, this ..might have been going for a slightly more piddling sum. That's why I never thought I'd go to the dunny with a Rolling Stone. <laughs> well, now it's done. In the dunny. <laughs> that's it. Ronnie's a man still living his boyhood dream. Well, you wanted to be a rock star. Well, I wanted to be in the Stones, and that was the end of the deal, yeah. Specifically. Oh, yeah. yeah. You and every kid in the world wanted to be a Rolling Stone. Even, even me, but I have no musicality and I can't hold a note. Yeah, well, they weren't in the right place at the right time then. <laughs> I was. <laughs> of course, you can't have rock star egos in the same stage for 50 years without some friction. Mick and Keith have had their differences, but today, maybe they're too old to care. Do you get on personally as well as you do musically? Oh, yeah, just You don't about. need to live in one of those pockets. No, no, not at all, not at all. But, uh, I mean, apart from one or two, you know, the obvious... I mean, after 50-odd years, everybody has a bundle now and again, you know? <laughs> but, sure. I mean, no, absolutely. I wouldn't be coming to Australia next year. You know, with the guys, if there was, uh, you know, uh, anything. We, we argue about details. We don't argue about the meat of the matter. Meeting them, I have to remind myself I'm talking to men who would be old age pensioners, were they not so busy and so rich? Then, when they take to the stage, the years fall away, and they are what they've always been, and presumably always will be, the unstoppable stones. Because you still have fun. I mean, yeah, still have a lot of fun. You, in fact, look like you're having more fun than in earlier times. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I can't. It's very hard to quantify <laughs> yeah, it. Sure. I was having fun in the early times, but, you know, it. it's... You know, I, I enjoy it very much. I mean, I, I really enjoy it being out there. And the uh, title of that song, The Last Time, this won't be the I'll last time <laughs> you come to Australia. <laughs> Who, uh, I don't know. Who can say? I've never said it would be. I've never said it won't be. Um, with this lot, nothing surprises me, you know. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we do it in 10 years and Charlie Watts will still be giving you the best backbeat that you can ever get. And, uh, and Mick will probably still be able to do amazing pirouettes and... But they're an amazing bunch of guys, you know. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.